Mr Speaker, the refrain of the government bench in today's debate has been that India's current economic system for developing is failing currently. So let's just try something else. Chris and I conceded that the current system of development is not perfect, but we made some important observations in this debate about why this process would not be a good idea for India's development. What were those? The first was to point out that India's current rate of development is actually quite good and that the characterizations of this bench were unrealistic. The second thing was to point out that there is currently a very large rising group of middle class business owners who will be fundamentally shut out of this new liberalised market because although they are rising, they currently cannot compete with the economies of scale of the types of businesses that this would see flood the market. And the second thing that we told you importantly was that the breakdown of inequalities in India is still an ongoing project. So that's why the response of the closing government, that these corporations would just hire whoever was the best worker, yeah. didn't really make very much sense. Because currently, because it is an ongoing project, the best worker is someone who has been of a privileged class. Because they're the ones who have been educated. They're the ones who have jobs previously and have got on the job training. We think that when you allow the market to be flooded by capital and you allow the current people in power to determine state contracts and to entrench their comparative advantage currently, that that just leads to the same inequalities being perpetuated. This debate is obviously a trade-off between sustainable development and immediate development. But in that trade-off, what Chris and I told you importantly is that prioritising immediate development would actually mean that local development was not possible in the long term because it would undermine all of the root growth Madam. that would allow that local growth to occur. No, thank you. The first thing that I'm going to look at in this speech is what would these corporations do? What would be their influences? Harvard told you two things. The first was in regards to employees. They said that they would hire them and that they would train them. We have a number of responses to that. Firstly, we think that foreign firms will pay their workers less than the current business owners in India, but also that it is not true that they will hire more workers. Let's analyse this. When you have the economies of scale of Walmart and you have greater capacity to do things like invest in technology that makes labour redundant, we think you actually end up hiring less workers. It's not the case that there will be thousands more jobs under this proposal because of the comparative advantage of these international companies, which is the very thing that will also lead them to crowd out the current businesses in India that are providing employment as they develop. We think that that's very, very important. When you say that these, these middle class business owners are important under your proposal in order to facilitate things like political accountability and in order to like, lead to the sort of democratic agitation that the uh, government with, uh, members spoke to you about, we think that you lose that class when you expect them to compete with things like big box retailers. The only reason why we think we have seen the development of middle class business owners in India is because they have shut out people like big, big box retailers which has allowed them to develop to the state that they are in but importantly they are still such a nascent industry that they would be sacrificed Madam. as a result of this. Then Harvard tells you that actually corporations would also invest in infrastructure and that would be a good thing. There are a number of things to note about the type of infrastructure that would be provided under this proposal. The first is that it would actually only be incidental to their corporate needs. So it isn't the case that they would be doing this from a philanthropic perspective, but just if they needed to build a road into their factory, you might incidentally get the benefit of that. We don't think that that's good enough when you compare it to the type of infrastructure that a government is able to provide. Because a company never has the incentive to provide services to people who can't afford services, for instance, whereas a government does. And the really bizarre response of, to this like, line of argumentation from the closing government was that, well, the government has an incentive to go where the votes are, as if votes are this evil ephemeral concept in this debate. Like, the reason why there is a vote is because there is a person there. But also, as Chris and I told you, votes is a better incentive upon which to operate is because they are distributed equally, whereas that is not the case when you talk about following an economic incentive because not everyone has the same type of capital, so not everyone is providing the right. same sort of market right. for these corporations. That was really, really important. The final line of defence of the government bench in this debate was to say that, well, actually, we'll just get more tax revenue, so even if they're not very good at providing infrastructure, we'll get the revenue. We told you why that was highly unlikely, because in order to attract this form of foreign direct investment, the way the government will go about doing this is to provide like favourable tax relationships in order to allow that foreign direct investment to occur. We've seen that be the 
process in other countries, we don't think that that's a good thing. Yeah. All right, what do you hear at closing about the social impacts? You hear that you can get with lower cost goods. There are a number of reasons why that is actually not a benefit in this debate. The first is that whilst you may get lower cost goods yeah. at the beginning, I'll take opening in a minute, you don't get the control of profits. So you don't get any of the benefit of providing those lower cost goods. The second thing is that local firms also have an incentive to provide lower cost goods to the extent that that allows them to have access to a market that is able to purchase them. But also, those local firms would never be able to create these products if they are crushed by the competition of the, the large international companies that are coming in. Yes. So we're slightly confused about why this debate is suddenly only about Walmart's FDI and not property rights or state-owned enterprises. But in general, India is not a 1960s underdeveloped country beginning its growth with infant industries. It's a top 10 global economy. So when will they be ready to liberalize and compete on the global scale on your side of the house? They are currently on a significant projection towards development. But what we have told you is that although there has been this development towards middle class business owners, that that is going to be one that is stifled as a result of the type of flood of international competition that most of the benefits of your case relied on in this debate. Let's look finally at the capability of the Indian government. They told you a number, well they tried to give you a number of reasons why it was inherently impossible for the Indian government to do this well. The most compelling one of those was that they were decentralised and that made it very inefficient and very difficult. We actually think that that is a good attribute of India because what that leads to is the states needing to compete in order to have different forms of regulation and market favourabilities for internal companies. We think that makes their market actually quite efficient when there is lots of internal competition as to where businesses can efficiently set up. We would also say that all of the political problems that you guys pointed to are going to be rife throughout the process of liberalisation and this is what Chris told you. You guys don't break down monopolies because a lot of these services are natural monopolies. I certainly hope that someone doesn't try and build a rival Chennai metro because I think that's going to disrupt the traffic around this city quite significantly. At the end of this debate, what we told you is that the economy of India is not ready to take on this form of flooding in international competition. We would prefer long-term development. That's why we oppose the motion.